All right, how you guys doing this morning? Doing pretty good? I want to welcome you guys to our fourth and final week of our series called The Unseen. And in this series, we've been talking about how there's more going on than just what meets the eye. And so in week number one, we talked about how every single one of us are in this unseen battle, whether we recognize it or realize it or not. And, and the Bible tells us that, that we don't fight against flesh or, or blood, that, that the people around us, people aren't our enemy. Instead, we have a, a spiritual enemy who would love nothing more than to get us to fight the wrong battles and fight for the wrong things. But we learned in week number one that we're not fighting for victory. Instead, we're fighting from victory. And the Bible tells us that we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus and that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then in week number two of this series, we talked about some, some unseen strategies and how our, our enemy is trying to get into our heads and mess with our thoughts. And we know that our lives will always move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And so we're going to think about what we're thinking about, make sure that our thoughts line up with the truth of God's word. Because as a person thinks, so they become. And then last week, in week number three, we talked about this unseen reward and how we're not focused on where we are, but instead where we're going. That there's this eternal reward called heaven. And as we look beyond just the, the here and now, and we live for this unseen reward, it changes our perspectives and how we live our lives on this earth. And, and today I want to kind of conclude uh, this sermon series by talking to us about the unseen mission. How many of us know this morning that God has a plan with purpose for each and every one of our lives that will ultimately bring fulfillment to us? That God not only wants to, to touch and change our hearts and our lives, but then he wants us to share his goodness with others so that he can touch and change their lives too. And before we kind of jump into the message this morning, I do want to take a moment to look into the camera and welcome the men and women joining us from the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio. And I want to give a special welcome to all the students out at the Juvenile Detention Center as we launch a campus there today. We love you guys. We believe you. Come on, church. Let's welcome our church family. How cool is that, huh? Well, let's, let's start things off by taking a look one more time at our theme scripture for this entire series, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Paul's speaking here, and he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth here, and he's teaching us a, a spiritual principle that as we go beyond living for just the moment and we look at life through this eternal perspective, it changes our priorities. It changes what really matters to us, and it changes what we choose to focus on and even do with our short time on this earth. And so the question we might ask this morning is, what is this unseen mission that, that God has, not just for our church and, and, and for believers, but for anyone who has put their faith and trust and hope in God? And, and when Jesus was uh, on the earth, he actually gave us some pretty clear instructions as to what he wanted us to do. Let's take a look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16. Verse 15, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. And so one of the things we just believe around here at Experience Church is that church isn't just for church people, but that we exist for the people who aren't here yet. That, that church isn't just all about us, but instead we have this unseen mission to go beyond ourselves and impact the world around us. In fact, all of us here this morning and even those watching online really are in one of two places with God. Either, either we're in this place of kind of finding God and trying to discover who he is and who he wants to be in our lives, and, and, and you might find yourself in that place this morning, that your whole goal this morning is just to, to find God and enter into this relationship 
with him. But, but once we find him, then he invites us to be a part of his team. He invites us to, to go on this unseen mission to, to share his love and his goodness and impact the world around us. In fact, we need to understand this morning that God really, 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 really loves his kids that are lost. And speaking of lost things, you might have heard me tell the story before, but a couple of years uh, ago, uh, my wife and I and our, our two kids at the time, uh, young Brax, my year old, wasn't on the scene yet, so Jason Tessa was with us, and we were in Columbus, Ohio for uh, my, my cousin's wedding, and, and uh, went down on a Friday, we were staying at a, a rather large hotel in Columbus, had like over 30 floors, and, and so the day of the wedding, Saturday morning came, and, and just being the good father and the good, incredible husband that I am, I decided to take the kids swimming at the pool at the hotel and give my wife some time to herself, hoping that that would come back to uh, benefit me later on in life. Come on, husbands. Anybody else there? So I did that, man, and we had a blast at the pool and, and, and all that, and so we're actually uh, on our way back up to the hotel room to get ready for the wed wedding that's later that afternoon, and something you need to know uh, about this hotel is that uh, the elevator doors shut a little bit quicker than they were supposed to, a little bit quicker than normal. It's really key to the story. And so we're riding back the elevator back up to our floor and to our room. I think we were like on floor 20 something, 25 or, or whatever. And, and I'm talking to Jason and, and Jace is, is, he just turned six, Tessa just turned four. And me and Jace are talking, the doors open for our floor and me and Jace step out. We're talking, I get about two steps from the elevator and I realized for whatever reason, Tessa didn't come with me. I don't know, she just froze, got cold feet, didn't want to get off the elevator, but for whatever reason, she didn't get off the elevator, and I turn around and see her, our eyes meet, but remember, the elevator doors uh, are not up to code, and they shut really crazy fast, and so I'm looking at her, our eyes meet, and I'm like, no, and, and the doors shut, uh, and she's on the elevator. So I immediately go over and hit the button trying to get the, the elevator back. Now, just so you know, there's four elevators in this hallway, in this hotel, and uh, a few seconds go by, and all of a sudden, the light dings above the elevator we just got off of. I'm thinking to myself, whew, dodged a bullet there. The doors open up pretty rapidly because that's just what they did in this hotel. And I look in, and Tess is gone. She is not on the elevator anymore. And at that point, I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. My wife, Justina, is going to kill me. I lost Tessa. I lost one of our kids. And really, at that point, I'm really starting to panic because I'm thinking to myself, what do I do? There's over 30 floors in this hotel. Do I, I mean, how, she's off, she got off the elevator, but what floor? Where is she at? I, I don't know what to do. And, and, and then I start thinking, worst case scenario, like what if somebody grabbed her? What if some guy grabbed her and is trying to kidnap her? Do I go down to the lobby and, and wait for somebody to try and run off with my girl and, and let them know that was the dumbest decision they ever made in their lives? That was the last decision they made in their life. Well, what do I do? And I'm kind of in this moment. I'm trying to figure out what to do. And, and just, I can't, I, I really can't. I, I almost, I kind of froze in the way I just didn't know what to do. And I'm going through all these scenarios and variables and options that I have. And all of a sudden, I hear this ding from one of the elevators behind me, different elevator than we rode up to the, to the floor. And all of a sudden, the doors open up crazy fast, because remember, that's what they did in the, in the elevator, because it wasn't my fault that I lost Tessa, and, and out walks this blonde-haired woman holding Tessa, who's crying in her arms. She walks over to me and hands me Tessa and saves my life by doing that. And, and I, don't, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm just saying, there, there is a part of me that thinks, that could have been an angel. I'm just saying, like, I don't know for a fact, I just don't know, but the, 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 for a few reasons, I think that. One, she never said a word to me. Like, if I found somebody's little girl crying in a hotel on the floor, and then I found her parents, I would have went up to her like, hey, I found her on floor 29. She was just standing in the hotel crying. I'm so glad I was able to get back, get her back to you. And I, they probably would have said, thank you so much. You're incredible. I'm like, yeah, I know. Thanks. Have a good day. And I would have walked off, right? Some, there would have been some kind of dialogue. This woman said nothing. Didn't even say a word. 
And how did she know what floor I was on? Like Tessa was four, she didn't know what floor, how did she know what floor? And then I didn't even say that I was the dad. She didn't even ask me if I was that. She just, I just turned around, looked at her and she walks up and just hands me. How did she know I was even the father? I'm just telling you, it could have been an angel. I'll let you go on that journey to discover uh, that for yourself. But the whole point of the story is that in, if you've ever lost something, that you value. If, you, if you've ever lost something that's really, really important to you, nowhere in that moment are you, are you taking a, an inventory of all the other things that you still have. Like I wasn't thinking to myself, well, I still got Jace with me and 50% of my kids is still not a bad percentage. We're okay. Like, like if you lose your keys, you don't think to yourself, well, I still got my wallet, so I'm okay. In other words, you're distracted by what's lost. In that moment, you're di- distracted by what's Loss. Can I just tell us this morning that God is distracted by what's lost. God is distracted by the kids, his kids, that are lost. And as he looks down at the church this morning, don't get me wrong, he appreciates us coming in this place and worshiping him and lifting our hands and honoring him and dressing up and all the things that we do. He appreciates it, but he's not infatuated with it. In other words, it's not what's most important to him. In fact, the Bible tells us that he would leave the 99 that are found to go find the one that is lost. In fact, the whole reason we exist as a church is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are Christ ambassadors, that we're here to represent Jesus. Let me say it like this. The only Jesus people will ever see is you and me. He says we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. This is the unseen mission that God has for each and every one of us, that he would become real to others by the way we live our lives. And this, this can be kind of, the problem with this is it can kind of be uh, a little difficult in, in a world that's growing even more skepti- skeptical of, of who God is. Maybe even being adamantly against Christianity all together, maybe even having so many preconceived ideas about who God is and what Christianity is all about that doesn't even line up with what the Bible says. It can be incredibly difficult to be Christ's ambassadors. But can I just tell us this? Because of those reasons, now more than ever, we need to be focused on what's unseen. Now more than ever, we have to be aware of this unseen mission that God has for each and every one of us. And, and I feel like when it comes to this, this topic, many Christians can actually get it wrong. That too often we can end up in one of two extremes. One extreme churches and even Christians say is like, well, let's just become more like the world. Like, like that's, just the way, that's just the way things are. In our day and age, that's just the world we're living in. Let's be more inclusive. Let, let, let's, change, let's change what the Bible says so, so more people can, can fit in. Let, let's just let culture influence us. But can I just tell us this morning, in order to, to make a difference, how many of us know we have to be different? We have to be different in order to make a difference. And we don't have to water down anything to have influence in this world. But then on the other side, there's this other extreme where where Christians and churches, they become so dogmatic and rude and unattractive that nobody, including myself, even wants to be around them. But how many of us know that we can speak truth in a way that's appealing to others? That that we can can still have influence without compromise. And that's why the Bible says this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says, be wise. Everybody say, be wise. Be wise. Don't be loud. Be wise. Don't be silent. Be wise. Don't even be right. Be wise. In other words, the goal isn't to be right. The goal is to be effective. How many of us know we can, we can be right in what we say, but be wrong in how we say it? The Bible says, be wise in, 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 how you, in the way you act towards outsiders, that we're Christ's ambassadors, so be wise. Make the most of every opportunity. How? By letting your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, 
we make it taste good. We present truth in a way that somebody wants more of it, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so how do we live out this unseen mission? Or we could say, how do we share our faith with others? Check out what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says. He says, always be prepared. The problem is we're not always prepared. Maybe, maybe, maybe you never heard a message on this topic, or, or maybe you've just been told, well, go out and do it, but no one has ever told you how. How do we share our faith? How do we live out this unseen mission? How do we live out the great commission that, that Jesus gave to us? He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. And what's interesting about this scripture here is that here the Bible is already assuming that you and I are living our lives in such a way that people look at our lives and they want what we have. Like something is different about you. You keep coming into this factory and it's a miserable place and we're complaining about why we have to be here and how long we have to be here and how dirty this is and we're complaining, but you don't complain at all. That you have this joy that nobody else has. And when we're complaining about our boss, you don't do it. In fact, you tell us to stop doing it. In fact, I see, I know your life and you're going through some struggles and there's some issues, but yet there's a peace about you in the midst of the storm and something's different about you. I don't know what it is, but as I look at your life, something is different and I want what you have. I, I want the peace. I want the joy that I don't have. What's different? There's something different about you, that we'd be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason. What's, what's the reason for your hope? What's the reason for you to have the hope that you have? Why do you go to church every Sunday? Why are you involved in small groups? Why are you so involved in the church? Why do you pray? The Bible says be, be prepared to give an answer for your Hope. And so this morning, I want to take a look at three ways that we can live out this unseen mission and share our faith with others. If you're taking notes this morning, the first way we can share our faith with others and live out this unseen mission is number one, is to connect with people. Let me say it this way, connect before we correct. Connect before we correct. Too many people try to correct first and people don't want to receive it. People don't, people don't want to be corrected first, they want to be connected with. And, and Jesus, man, he was amazing at this. Like, the, here's the genius of Jesus, that, that he connected with people. That The genius of Jesus is that he never compromised truth, yet sinners loved to be around him. Like, they were always at his feet, weren't they? And it wasn't because he was like, just live however you want to live and do whatever you want to do. No, he was constantly telling them, man, leave your life of sin. He was straightforward with them, but he connected with them first. And the reason is people don't care how much you know until they know that you care. By the way, that's why we're launching a Dream Center here in a few weeks, that we could come alongside people and love people right where they're at and serve them and help meet their physical needs. And as we do, that would create opportunities for us to give them what they really need and meet their spiritual needs, that we can introduce them to Jesus and Jesus can touch and change and heal and deliver them from the inside out. We're also launching a Dream Center because we want to gain the respect of our community, of our city, because we just believe that the church should rise up and have a strong presence working with our city officials and other organizations in our community because we have what everybody's looking for. We have the answer to their problems. His name is Jesus. Amen, everybody? Jesus said this, check it out, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, and Jesus is basically defining his entire mission, that he came for one thing and one thing only. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what's lost, to come and seek and save what's lost. But you know what's interesting about this, this verse? It's not necessarily verse 10 of Luke chapter 19, it's the first nine verses, because you know the story that he tells and the, uh, that is told to us in the first nine verses? The story of Zacchaeus. See, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he, for all you Baptists in the house. That was, that was for you. 
But it's, and if you've ever read the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Uh, we know back in Bible times, tax collectors were despised by the people. Number one, you're working for the government and you're taking money from me, so we don't like you already. But tax collectors were known for upping the ante and, ante and robbing from the people. For example, if, if the family owned, owed $200 to the government, tax collectors would come to them and say, hey, you owe 250. And they would take that $50 and they would pocket it. And so they were constantly robbing people and stealing from people and, they, and the people could do nothing about it. They, the tax collectors back in the day was like a sleazy politician. Like nobody wanted to be around them. Nobody respected them, nobody liked them. Well, that's Zacchaeus. And so one day it tells us in the first nine verses of Luke chapter 19 that, that one day Jesus was coming through town and Zacchaeus wanted to know who he was. Notice that. He didn't want to know what Jesus knew. He wanted to know who he was. Can I just tell you this morning that people want to know who you are, not what you know. They're looking at your life and they want to know who are you really. I know you say you're a Christian. I know you say you go to church, but who are you really? Does your life live up to what you say? Who are you really? The Bible tells us that because he was a wee little man, much shorter than me, he climbed up in a sycamore tree and so he could get a look at Jesus. And Jesus actually, as he's going through town, walks right up to this sycamore tree and he looks at Zacchaeus and you know what he doesn't tell him? Zacchaeus, you tax collector, you thief, you robber, change your life, fix your, quit doing that. Jesus doesn't say that to him. You know what he says? Zacchaeus, come on down. Let's go to your house. Let's go, let's go to your house and eat. I, I want to connect with you. I, I want to get into your life. I want to know what you like and what you don't like. I, I want to see your family. I, I want to see your house. Where do you live? Let's, let's go share a meal together. Let's just, I want to connect with you. And then, then they, the Bible doesn't tell us what happens in that lunch meeting that Jesus has with Zacchaeus, but we, we know what happens afterwards. After the lunch they have, Zacchaeus surrenders his life to Jesus, basically, gets saved, and then he makes the comment, if I've cheated or robbed anyone out of, of anything, I'll repay them four times the amount. See, something, something was different about that. He had an encounter with Jesus and it changed his life forever. Why? Because Jesus connected with him before he tried to correct him. And it tells this story that he, he gets saved, he's going to repay everybody. Then, then Jesus goes to verse 10 of Luke chapter 19. He says, for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. And so if we're going to have a church that looks like Jesus, then we better be willing to do what Jesus did. The second way that we can live out this unseen mission and share our faith with others is number two, is by looking for an opportunity to share our story with people. To share my story with people. How many know we all have a story? Every single one of us. And, and there could be this misconception that if you didn't spend 20 years in prison or a drug addict or weren't in a car crash and an angel saved you out of the car, like you don't have some drastic story that you don't have a testimony. Can I just tell you this morning that if you've had an encounter with the presence of God and he has changed you from the inside out, you have a story. You have a, God is doing something in, because that's what everybody else needs to hear. They don't necessarily need to hear about my drug addiction. They need to know about how I had an encounter with Jesus and he changed my life forever. And if I could give the best advice I could give to each and every one of us on this topic of, of living out this unseen mission and sharing our, fa our faith is not to tell people how to change. In fact, you can read the Bible cover to cover, all the way from the, the, the table of contents all the way back to the maps. You will not find a scripture that tells us to go around and figure out everybody's problems and issues and struggles and make sure we point it out to them. There's not a scripture in the entire Bible that says that. In fact, you know what the truth is? The truth is we already know our issues, don't we? I already know my struggles. I already know where I fall short. I already know my issues because we all got issues. And if you don't think you got issues, man, that is your issue because we all got stuff. We all got things that we struggle. We all got problems. In fact, I don't need you to point it out to me. I don't need you to point my problems out to me. I need you to point me to the answer. I need you to give me the solution. You know, back when I worked at Teen Challenge uh, in South Dakota as a, a men's 18 and older Christian alcohol and drug rehab, and people would call and say, hey, my son's addicted to this, or we'd have men call and say, hey, I'm 30, I'm 40, I've been addicted to alcohol, I've been addicted to this all my life. Uh, and we, every once in a while they'd ask us a question, so, so do you have any alcohol or drug classes at a Teen Challenge? And we'd be like, no. 
No, we don't have any of those classes. Uh, because the truth is, the people that are coming into our program, they already know all they need to know about alcohol. They, all, they know all the effects of alcohol. They know the effects of drugs. They know more than most people know about drugs and alcohol. They don't need us to educate them on anything. We don't need to sit around and talk about their problems and their issues and their struggles. We need to sit around and focus on the answer, Christ and Him crucified. Who is Jesus and who does Jesus want to be in our lives? I don't need to point out your problems. I need to point you to the answer. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice our light shines because we're doing some good deeds and we're living a life that's attractive. Then people start to look at our lives and say, man, I, I, want, I, I want that. I, I want what you have. What do, what do we have? A relationship with God. That's the difference maker. Not that I'm perfect, not that I have it all figured out, but I have this relationship with God that's changed me from the inside out. And so that's why it's important for us to live out Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Take a look at it with me. It says, you will be my witnesses. Everybody say witnesses. witnesses. You'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, Jesus said. God's called us to be his witnesses. Well, what does a witness do? Well, if you go into a courtroom, and maybe you've never been there, so just take my word for it. I've been there a couple times, a few times. There's a few people in the room. There's the judge. There's the prosecutor. There's the defender. And then there's the witness. Well, God's not called us to be the judge, so don't judge. God's not called us to persecute anyone, so don't persecute anyone. God's not called us to defend. He's a big enough God. I don't need to defend him. He's a big, he can take care of himself. He's got pretty big shoulders. He doesn't need me running around trying to defend him. Instead, he's called me to be his witness. Well, what does a witness do? Simply tell their side of the story. This is what I saw, and this is what happened to me. My life was a mess. I was confused, lost, alone, and all of a sudden, I had an encounter with God, and he changed me from the inside out. I simply just tell my story. This is what God did for me, and if he did it for me, he could do it for you. I'm just called to be his witness. Come on. Are you with me at all this morning? I'll come off the stage. I will. Third way we can live out this unseen mission and share our faith with others is number three is to invite them to a place where they can experience God. That's why we call it Experience Church because it means to, one of the definitions of the word is to actively participate with God and what he's doing. That we would invite them to a place where people can have an encounter with God. That's our prayer every single week. We're at corporate prayer that happens every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. at the church complex. If you've never been there, I'm inviting you. I'm telling you, it's the best hour of your week as we gather into this room and we just cry out to God and we pray for him to move in our own lives, in our families, in this community, in this church. And yesterday, we're just crying out yesterday, God, move in this place. God, let your presence be in this place. Not that, that people would come into these doors and, and not, that not only they would enjoy the music and the free coffee and the incredible, amazing teaching and sermon that they get to hear every, not only would they, they enjoy that, but God, more than anything else, more than all of those things, let your presence be here. Let your presence be in this place. In fact, I was talking with our staff this past week and just kind of going over some, just sharing with uh, them some of the, my routine when I speak every week that I try uh, to have the message written and done by Wednesday. Now, it doesn't always happen, but I try for, for Wednesday, if not Thursday morning, the message is written. And then I spend uh, a few hours on Thursday, a few hours on Friday, a few more hours Saturday morning, and then I go into the uh, office almost every uh, Saturday night from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., and I'm studying that message. And every time I'm, I'm studying, I'm always in this, this one little room at the church office, and I was telling them that, man, these walls in this office have rededicated their life to Jesus multiple <laughs> times. I'm just saying that 
right now. But I told him as I go in Saturday night, like, I don't like giving up Saturday night. Like, Saturday night is my time because I'm not just going into this room and studying points. I'm not just going in this room and, and reading over scriptures or thinking about what I'm going to say. That the first 30 minutes, 45 minutes of my time up there is I get on my knees. And I cry out to God, God, let your presence be in this place. Let the people that come in these doors have an encounter with something that's not man-made. That they'd have an encounter with the living God. And God would change them from the inside. God, we need your presence in this place. Otherwise, we're just making noise. Otherwise, we're just playing church. Let your presence be in this place. Let you become real to people in a way that they've never encountered you before. Because that's what's going to make the difference in their life. Not that we just tell them about Jesus, that they experience experience Jesus. we got to invite them to a place where they have an encounter with a living God and they're like, something's different about that place. I'll never forget the one couple years ago that came uh, for the first time. We had, there's some neighbors of ours and we were reaching out to them and they finally came to experience church and, and after the message, I was like, hey, how's it going? Of course, they said good because that's what you all say even if you don't like it and I appreciate that. It was amazing. But they're leaving and, and they had this look on their face, face and they're like, I don't, I, 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 uh, I, and the wife started crying. She's like, I just, there was, was, I don't know what was, there was something in the room, then there, I don't know. And, and I knew they didn't have to say another word because I knew they had an encounter with something that wasn't man-made. It wasn't the music. It wasn't the guitar player. It wasn't the preacher. It wasn't the coffee. It was Jesus. It was his presence. They had an encounter with the living God because that's what's going to change each and every one of our lives. That's what it's about. That, that, that church isn't something we attend, that God is someone we encounter. That Christianity isn't something to be understood. Christianity is something to be experienced. There's a great example of this in the Bible with Saul who, who thought Christianity was a cult, thought Christianity was a joke, and so he made it his life's mission to go around and persecute and kill Christians until he had an encounter with God, and it changed everything. In fact, not only did God change his name from Saul to Paul, but God actually changed his heart. And because of that one encounter with God, check out how Paul said that he was going to share Jesus and his faith with others. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He says, you'll remember, friends, that, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, his plan for your life, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy, because trying to convince people doesn't work. Trying to convince people with words doesn't work, because people don't need head knowledge. They need an encounter with God that changes their hearts. He says, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did. Jesus crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this. In fact, I felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death. If you want to know the truth of it, anybody ever felt like that as you stepped out for God? Anybody ever felt like that as you at the workplace and you were sharing your faith with somebody else. I'll never forget the first time I, I shared my faith with somebody else. I, I, I was working construction. I was uh, drywalling, mudding and taping uh, to be exact. I wasn't very good at it, so don't call me if you have any holes in your house. I can't fix them. I don't know what I'm doing. It's horrible. But I'll never forget. So I'm on this construction crew, and we're in this new house, and it's break time, and and uh, I just knew, I felt like God was calling me to step it up. I was the only Christian on the crew and had to put up with a lot, of, uh, a lot of junk. If you've ever been in the construction world, you know what I'm talking about. And so I just felt like God was calling me uh, to, during lunch to pull out my little Gideon's orange Bible that I had. I don't even remember where I got it. And, and so I'll never forget that time. Like I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm done with my sandwich because I ate it. I tried to eat it as slow as I could, but ate it in like 10 seconds because I was nervous. And it was time for me to whip out the orange Gideon Bible. Because I knew as soon as I pulled it out, everybody was going to be like, what, what the crap's he doing? Like, what is that? I don't know. Was he reading the Bible? That's not the Bible. A, what's going on over there? So like, I'm pitting out. I'm sweating this bad. And uh, my lower back's, you know, just, it's, it's bad. And so I pull out, out of my lunchbox the thing, and I just open it up. I don't even know what I open up to, and I, I, I fake read. Like, I, I was so nervous. Like, there's, I couldn't, there's no way I could read. God was downloading nothing to me from the Word that day. I, just, I wasn't reading anything. I just was fake reading, looking at the page. And I was thinking to myself, are they going to kill me, make fun of me? What is happening? I, was, I felt so inadequate. I felt so, I was scared to death because I thought they were going to ridicule me. I thought they were just going to make fun of me. And guess what? Some of them did. And I was okay. 
because I knew who I was. I knew who God was in my life. I knew what he did for me. And I'll just tell you right now, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And I just decided to take the stand that day and say, no, this is who I am. I don't care what you think. I've had an encounter. I know what it's like to smoke weed. I know what it's like to party. I know what it's like to t- chase relationships and look for fulfillment, for fulfillment in all the wrong things. And I had an encounter with the living God, and he filled, uh, he filled a void in my heart that none of those other things could fill. So I know who I am. So you can make fun of me. I'm going to take a stand today and, and fake read this orange little Bible. And I did, and, and, uh, and th- throughout the next weeks, and, you know, there were some jabs and giving me a hard time, but I just stayed the course. I probably didn't handle everything perfectly. I was just stepping out of my comfort zone, trying to honor God, trying to do the right thing. And I'll never forget, three months into it, one of, one of my crew workers had a terrible accident, 4th of July weekend, and they shot a cannon off. I wasn't with them, but they shot a cannon, homemade cannon in their front driveway, and the base of it, this metal base, came flying into this garage where he was standing, having a conversation, not even paying attention to the fireworks, and it literally just chopped his leg off, severed his leg, and he dropped, and, and uh, he lost his leg, and you know who the first person they called after he got, they got him to the hospital? This, this guy that whipped out this little orange Bible on their crew that decided to take a stand even though he was scared to death, even though he didn't know how people were going to react, even though he was worried that they were going to make fun of him, but he just knew God had changed his life. They called that guy. And I went up to the hospital, and I was able to pray with, the whole crew was there, I was able to pray with this individual, because I just was willing to step out, and, and I didn't do it perfect, and check out, check out what Paul says, he goes, but the, he goes, I, I didn't, I didn't, imp- I was scared to death, if you want to know the truth of it, he goes, and so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else, like there was nothing special that I did, I didn't, I just read, I fake read the orange Bible, I wasn't even really reading, I didn't even do that right. But the message came through anyways. But the message, God, you still moved. You still, you still used me, even in my insecurity, even in my inadequacies, even when I was scared to death, even when I was pitting out, you still used me, God. The message came through anyways. How? Well, through God's spirit and God's power did it. And the word spirit there in the Greek is the word pneuma, which literally means this breath of God, this breath of life. In other words, we can't see it. I, I, don't, I, I didn't know, I didn't recognize it, but, but we can feel it. We can experience it. Little did I know that as I whipped out the little orange Bible, they were feeling something they had never felt. They were experiencing something they had never experienced, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. I love that because we don't want just this, an emotional experience with God, these, these warm fuzzies. I want God to have a real encounter with God. I had a real encounter with his love. It wasn't a person that I had an encounter with. It was a God that I had an encounter It was his spirit that I had an encounter with. And I just want you to know this morning, if you're on that journey this morning of trying to just discover and who God is. I know grandma told me about God, and I know mom and dad told me about God, and I, I know this person told me. But if you're on that journey of discovering who God is for yourself, I want you to know there's no pressure here. That you can go, we want you to just go on that journey. Be you. Go on that journey of discovering who God is and who he wants to be in your life. And and you don't don't have to do anything or give anything or serve anything. Just go on that journey of discovering who he is. That you come into place, God, I just just want to know you. If you're real, God, speak to my heart. Do a work in me. Because the real reason people say no to God is because they have a wrong view or picture or understanding of who he is. Because nobody, nobody that's experienced what I've experienced, nobody who's had an encounter like I've had an encounter with God would ever say no to the plan that God has for them. The truth is too many people just have a wrong picture of who God is and a wrong understanding of what Christianity is all about. And that's why it's vital for the church and believers to rise up and and fulfill this unseen mission and share our faith and let our light shine so that we can undo some of these wrong pictures of who God is. And Jesus had to do this too. Check out Mark chapter 8 verse 27 through 29. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? 
By the way, your response to that question will dictate how you live your life. Who do you say that Jesus is? And they replied, well, well, some say John the Baptist. Well, at this time, John the Baptist had already had his head cut off. He had already been beheaded, and some people thought that, 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 that Jesus was uh, John the Baptist reincarnated. Then others said, well, maybe you're Elijah. And we know that Elijah didn't die, that he actually came in a chariot of fire, came and, and in a whirlwind took him up to heaven. So a lot of people thought, well, maybe you're just Elijah and you just came back to earth. Others, though, thought you're just one of the prophets, that you're a godly man, that you're a prophet, but that's, that's about all you are. And then Jesus looked at them and says, but what about you? I think he'd look at many of us this morning. I, I know the world says this about Christianity. I know my coworkers say that about Jesus. I know some of my friends give me a hard time about God. I know what they say about Jesus, but what do you say? Who is he to you? Who is he in your life? And Peter, Peter replies to him, well, you're the Messiah. You're, you're the Christ. You're what I've been looking for. You're, you're what I've been missing the whole time. Like, I know my construction crew could give me a hard time and make fun of me, but you don't get it. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He was what I was looking for the whole time. And he filled the void of my heart. And I didn't, I was around church and didn't really know he was the answer the entire time until I had an encounter with him. Let me just say, if we can experience that, man, that's real Christianity. That's what church is really about. Let me experience that. But instead of seeing God for who he really is, so many people can have this wrong view. And, and I'll just go over two wrong views this morning as I'm running out of time. The first wrong view that we can have of God is that he's a locked gate. He's just a locked gate. In other words, God's there. I just can't get to him. In other words, he's there. I just, I'm kind of locked out. I'm not welcome. Have you ever been to a place where the door's locked and you, you can't even see inside? Like, I, I know God is there, but I just, I'm not allowed in. Because my life is such a mess, I'm not allowed in. Maybe, maybe you heard people say, well, if I go to church, lightning will strike that place. Anybody heard someone say that? And I know they're kind of making a joke and even using that as an excuse not to go to church. But the underlining thing of what they're really saying is, man, if you knew what I did, and if you've known what I've done, there's no way that God would accept me. He's a locked gate. He's there, just not for people like me. But the truth is, Acts 17, 27 says, God doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's not far off. Instead, he's near. He, the Bible says he's close to the brokenhearted. And as I look back at my life, the times when I thought God would, had left me, I felt all alone in some of the darkest moments of my life, I realized as I look back, he was there the whole time. I just didn't, I just didn't know it. Another wrong picture of God that we can have is a pile of luggage, if you're taking notes, meaning that if we can just get rid of all of our baggage and if we can just stop being such a bad person, then maybe God would accept us, but, but, but not now because of the way that we've lived our lives and some of the things that we have done that we can feel like God doesn't, doesn't want us. But, but the truth is, God has even more compassion on us because he's longed, he's distracted by the fact that he wants us to, to live the lives that he intended us to live all along. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still messed up, while we still had all these issues, while we were still sinners. I love the fact that God didn't wait for me to get all cleaned up and get my life, everything in order in my life before he sent Jesus to die for me. No, no, no. While they spit at him, while they mocked him, while they drove the nails into his, when I was out there using drugs, when I was sitting in a jail cell, when I was out there making all those stupid decisions and living for myself and doing what I want to do, Christ came for me. Christ made a way for me that I'm going to make a way for him to know my love. I'm going to blow his mind by, by, by the love I want to pour out into his. Wow, I was still messing up. God had me in mind. Anybody else this morning? The truth is, if you're taking notes, the true picture of God is that he's a free gift. It's a free gift. That God wants to give us something we don't deserve. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. It's the free gift of God. Romans 6, 23, and we'll close. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, 
our Lord. The truth is, what do you do with a gift? You just receive it. I'm trying to give you something. Just take what I'm trying to give you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we love you in this place. God, we thank you for your love. God, we thank you for this unseen mission. And it all starts with your love, what you've done in us, God. And this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, as we're praying, nobody looking around. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning, you would say, man, I've had a wrong picture of God, too. I've seen him as a locked gate. But he's there. I just can't get there. My life's too messed up. I just can't get to him. Maybe as a, a pile of luggage. Like, i got to get rid of all my luggage and stop being such a bad person before God would accept me. We can also see, see God as, a, as this endless ladder, but there's so many things that he wants us to do. There's just no way we could do it all. And God says, no, 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 I, I don't want you to do anything. I just want your heart. I just want your heart. It's a free gift. Maybe you're here this morning, and God's doing a work in your heart. It's his time. Say, here, I've sur- I surrender my life to you, God. I'm, I'm ready to receive this free gift. God changed me from the inside out. I surrender my life to you. If that's you, with, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, would you lift your hand up and say, that's me. I want this free gift. I want this relationship with God. I want to know who he is for real. Praise God. I see your hands. Would you just pray this with me right where you're at? Say, God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for connecting with me before you try to correct anything. Thank you for just pouring out your love in my life. And this morning, I just, I want to know you, to have a relationship with you. Not just to know about you, but to truly know you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the price for my sin and loving me when I was still living for myself. God, forgive me my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. My life is yours. As we continue praying this morning, maybe you're here and as we talk about this unseen mission, sharing our faith with others, that you know that God's calling you to step out of your comfort zone. Maybe just whip out that orange little Gideon Bible. Just let your light shine. That other people could have an encounter with God and never be the same. And if you, if you feel like God's calling you to step up to this unseen mission and impact the world around us, I just want to pray that God would give you strength, God would give you courage, God's presence and hand would be upon you, and God would use you to impact the people around you. Would you lift your hand up and say, that's... I'm, God, I, I, I hear the call. I know there's this unseen mission to share my faith with others, to be a light in the midst of darkness, to love others and connect with them, to share my story and be a witness for you, God, and to invite them to a place where they can have an encounter with you, God. Use me today with my hand held high. Use me today, God. That somebody reached out to me, somebody loved me, they poured in me to you, God, and I want to be that for somebody else. God, use me to impact the people around me, my coworkers, my friends, my neighbors, my family, God. Let me be a light to share your goodness with others, that other people can experience your love and your freedom and your victory and your hope and your life and never be the same because of who you are. God, use me. We love you, God. We honor you and praise things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.